Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Three Fates Decide. My name is Sam, and tonight we are doing a duo episode with my co-host, Mary. Say hello. Hello, everyone. So, Mary and I are doing a duo uh, episode on uh, the Netflix series Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. And Liz is not a part of this because she did not watch the show. So uh, we thought now would be a great time to actually, uh, now would be a great time to actually uh, talk about it since Golden Globe nominations have come out and all that stuff. And, you know, so I know we did the original Jeffrey Dahmer episode a while back. And now... Uh, you know, nominations and stuff have come out. We wanted to go over the actual show. You think you know what we're going to talk about. And welcome back to Three Fates Decide. It just sounds more dramatic that way. All right. So this week we are going to be talking about... But just when you least expect it, we changed the game. One Will Smith slot Chris Rock. I mean, we always celebrated Easter. Here's part of the Half-Blood Prince. So we're going to do another... Free talk, freestyle thing, no planned discussion. At the end of the day, only one thing matters. We decide. We're going to hit the, the, the main highlights. That is the thing that we were saying back in that episode. A quick recap. Three Fates Decide podcast. So hang on to your hats, because it's crazy. Yes, this this was a very uh we talked about we we talked about Dahmer already in during our Halloween series of like our Halloween month of October. So but at that time I had not watched the actual show yet. Uh because I had other things that I was doing. So I finally got to watch the show, most of it. I there's like a couple of episodes I've I did not finish watching, but <laughs> that's okay yeah. i watched the whole thing <laughs> yeah but i i know enough of what's going on to know what's going on <laughs> yeah yeah so we're gonna go over each episode and uh there is i'm trying to remember 10 episodes 10, 10 episodes. episodes yes so we'll go over each episode not in huge detail but just kind of over the synopsis, we'll go over the actors that are in the movie. Um, we're going to go over the nominations for the Golden Globes, since this is the first chance, really, that they've had to get nominated. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to discuss what's actually true and what's not. Because, of course, there's always things that they throw in. Yes. And then uh, go over some of the backlash with this series, which seems to be quite the uh, theme for a lot of the either films or limited series for streaming. Uh, A lot of these shows have had a lot of backlash for kind of similar reasons. So we'll get into that a little bit, but. So basically the, the series, this was based on it. This is based on a, on real events that happened. Jeffrey Dahmer was a real person. He, and he, he did do all of these horrible, horrific things. That's the first thing that people need to realize. This is not just entertainment. This happened. Yes. This man destroyed hundreds of lives. I mean, I grant he did not he did not actually kill that many people, but if you if you thinking long term, he destroyed hundreds of lives with with what he did. Not only his family's lives, he destroyed the lives of all of his victims' families and their and their loved ones, and on down and down the line. So hundreds and of the lives. people that lived in the building and all that stuff. Yeah, I, exactly that too. So hundreds of people have been affected by what this man did, and so we are not condoning in any way what this man did. What this man did, what he did was a crime. He's a horrific man. He. He deserved, may he rot in hell. Yes, may he rot in hell. He deserved his punishment. I 
the only thing I do not think is I do not think he deserved to be murdered in prison himself. Yeah. I I do not believe that he deserved that. However, do I think that the person who did who ended up murdering him in prison is a bad person? Kind of because he was already in prison for murder. So the guy didn't really have anything left to lose. But he rid he ridded society of an evil, of a very evil individual. I just wish we could have gotten rid of him in a better way. Yeah. If that makes sense. It sounds weird to say it, but if it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, he got his karma 100%, but yes. Exactly. I I get what exactly. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the first thing we want to say about this is we are not condoning at in any way, shape or form what this man did. Our hearts and our, our hearts and our prayers and our sympathies go out to his family because his family, even though had nothing to do with it, you know, right. they had nothing to do with what he did. Yes. Um, his background shaped who he was and it maybe contributed to how he became who he became, but it was still 100% on him. Mm -hmm. And our hearts, at least my heart goes out to his family for the lot, for having to, put up with the shame of having a son like this or having a brother, uh, you know, whatever. And especially our hearts, our thoughts, our prayers go out to the victims, family of everyone that this affected. That's the, that, that is the main thing that we want, that we want people to understand. We're not condoning any of this. This is not, we're not doing this as entertainment. I mean, we're, we're wanting to put out the message because that's what Netflix did. Netflix put an, an entertainment spin on it, which, We'll get into mm -hmm. here in just a little bit, but yep, well said. Yeah, <laughs> well said. All right, so I guess to kind of start off, this is produced by Ryan Murphy and was created by Ryan Murphy and Ian Brennan. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know those names, they're also the creators of Glee. Uh, so how you go from, oh, and also American Crime Stories, which is also on Netflix. So they did the O.J. Simpson trial mm -hmm. and the assassination of uh, Versace. Yeah. And they just did uh, the whole thing about Clinton and uh, what's her face? Uh, Monica Lewinsky. Thank you. It's like her name was right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it is kind of funny how they went from glee into all that. but. You know, but yeah, whatever. So um, that, that's a huge shift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damn. So they uh, they created it. They're producers, you know, everything They're, everything is is them. They they wrote a lot of the ep or most of the episodes, if not all. I think there's maybe. Let me see. Yeah, here. there's a few uh, that that wasn't them. But for the most yeah. part, it, it's it's all them. So. There's um, one that does not have either one of them writing it. Yeah. Yeah, one or the other is in pretty much all of them, ex yeah, except for that one. And then yeah. uh, Ian, I guess, is really, like, the, the big writer. Yes, because he, he literally wrote all of them except for the one. Yeah. So. so crazy. Um, but it stars Evan Peters, who yes. was creepy. As Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, like, yes. you see him as Quicksilver in, you know, the the Marvel movies and, uh, right. like, the X-Men movies and stuff like that. And he's <laughs> hilarious. You know, like, he's like a joke, you know, like, in any, like, a lot of his movies, he kind of plays like that jokester. Like, he has, like, that weird sense of humor. And yes. then, like, you see him in this, and it's like, holy crap, this is the same dude? Yeah, but he was, I, I don't want to say he was born to play this role, but he did so good in the American Horror Story series. Yes. Because he was, he was like, in, I don't even know how many episodes, how many seasons there are of that now. Yeah, he was, he was in a was lot, in, though. He was in quite a few. A, yeah, several, of, several seasons of it. So... He he plays creepy well. He does. He he Looks does really well. well with the with the comedic side of things too. I mean, don't get us wrong, but he plays creepy 
a little too well. <laughs> a little I mean, I guess well. you can give him kudos because he can play both, which shows he's very well rounded. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So uh, I mean, yeah, he creeped me out. Like yeah, he, me he's out. one to he is one to watch as I I really seriously see him becoming a very very big name star in the mm-hmm. future. Yeah, because, I think this will really push him in that direction. Yes, because I mean, he he is such he can do so di- so much and so many different different um types of characters. I think he's probably going to I hate to say he's going to be more stereotyped towards the the horror stuff, but luckily with Marvel, he he did get the funny jokes are more lighthearted lighthearted comedic and he killed that too so yeah and they did actually just announce he's coming back as quicksilver in deadpool so oh which is awesome that's amazing yeah. so that, that'll be good yeah so evan peters definitely one to watch out for because he's Absolutely. i really i i really see him blowing up even bigger than he already is because i mean he's a pretty pretty well-known name among p pe- among certain groups anyway right this is just gonna like put him right over the top I think I really no. I agree, I agree. Uh, His father um, is played by Richard Jenkins, who I'm I'm a fan of. I I like you know yeah most of his movies. His stepmother is Molly Ringwald, who like I didn't even recognize her. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? I was like, whoa, you've come a long way from like Pretty in Pink and (laughs) what is it? Three sixteen. 16 candles there it is oh god um and then i am okay so i think it's it's niecy nash it is niecy she plays the neighbor glenda cleveland who i'm also a fan of hers again i didn't really recognize her which i I I did kudos to the cop well it's like until i actually like looked but it was like i was blinded obviously by the character which again is great for Mm -hmm. them that meant that their acting was like yeah on par but like all of a sudden i would look and i was like oh that's that's her that's so and so yeah and then um nice. the grandmother was played by uh, now i'm not sure if it's pronounced michelle learned right. or michael learned yeah i'm not real i'm not real sure um to be honest I know. I was looking at it. I was like, is that spelled wrong? It's No, that's the way it's supposed to be spelled. It is. Yeah. However. Oh, I didn't know she was the mother on the Waltons. Yeah. I was I was just getting ready to say that. Dude. The things yeah. you learn. Exactly. Right. So I, <laughs> like, I'm not real sure how she pronounces her first name. I like, yeah. I don't know if it's actually Michelle. And it's like a maybe a French version of spelling the name, or mm-hmm. her parents just thought she was going to be a boy, and they that's the only name they had, and she came out she came out a girl. Yeah, so, I don't know. Fantastic actress. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and that's like the main cast. I mean, obviously, there's a ton of actors and actresses mm-hmm. in this yes. uh, series that did a phenomenal job. We won't go through everything, but those are like the main actors um in in this in this whole thing so yes. all right so let's head into the episodes first one was called bad meat which is just gross that's just why <laughs> why yeah so in this it starts in 1991 glenda cleveland who's the neighbor lives next to jeffrey dahmer and is really concerned about the noises and smells coming through their shared vent. Meanwhile, Dahmer is courting his next potential victim, Tracy Edwards, in a bar and takes him home, but Tracy manages to escape and flag down police. Dahmer is arrested, and gruesome discoveries are made in his apartment. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, we start from the end type of, yeah. type of deal. We, we so, start, we, yes, we start when he's arrested. Yeah, which is just crazy. Yes. Absolutely crazy. 
It, it really was. I mean, to see how much, um, I, I don't want to say misconduct so much as just, and like it even says how much apathy there were, there was by the police that allowed him to do this mm -hmm. for years. Yeah. It is mind boggling. Yep. So yeah, that kind of, that episode just really kind of sets the premise as to, you know, how it's all going to wind up. And then from there, we we get into the nitty gritty. And I think the one thing that I kind of, I'm not going to say liked, because it's not that I specifically liked this episode or this uh, series, um, but that I appreciated, I guess I could say, yeah, is that they kept going back and forth between his childhood to his adulthood to kind of show like, you know, this is what he had as a kid and maybe this is why, you know, he became what he was type of deal. Yeah, uh -huh. it, show it really showed his childhood and what happened during his childhood that kind of shaped who he became as an adult male, as, mm -hmm. a, as, a, as, a, as an adult. Um, and it kind of shows that, I mean, his family had a little to do with it, but they're not really to blame for how he turned out. Because Agreed. they were they they were just very um it was a dysfunctional family. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. So it was sad. I mean yeah. in a way it was it was very sad. He had a very sad childhood and very sad upbringing. But that doesn't excuse or forgive anything that that he had that he did. As he Agreed. got older. Agreed. Yeah. Um, no sympathy. No, there's none. There's no sympathy to be had for this man. No. Um, then episode two uh, was called Please Don't Go. And this episode was really highlighted Dahmer's life as a preteen and adolescent living with his drug addicted mother and his often absentee father. He's this is when he starts getting his. Um, starts to exhibit his interest in dissecting dead animals. And he is encouraged that he gets very encouraged by his father to do this. And this is in the early, what, mid sixties. Mm -hmm. And just for clear, like his father's a scientist. So I think his father thought yes. he was getting into science. I really do think that that's why his father mm -hmm. was like encouraging him. He probably thought, yes. Ooh, he's going to be like a doctor or, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of scientist. So yeah. Exactly. And then then it goes back to 1991 and it shows Dahmer as an adult buying alcohol for a 14 year old, one of his his 14 year old victim. I am not going to uh, even attempt the names this time because I butchered them the last time we did these. <laughs> I, I know his first name is is Conorak. That's mm -hmm. as far as I'm going to go. I'm not going to pronounce his last name because I'm not going to butcher it again. And he and he lures his the, the this fourteen year old back to his apartment, um, saying he'll pay him for basically nude photos. Actually, he he actually drugs the this this child, um, because at this point he may be a teenager, he's still a child. He drugs the child and he experiments by by drilling a hole into the boy's head. We're not gonna we, we're not gonna go into it when Dahmer leaves. Conorak wakes up and tries to leave, but he's met by Glenda, who is the neighbor, and her daughter. And Glenda, being the concerned woman that she is, she realizes this is this is a child. So she calls the police. But Dahmer, being the charismatic person that he was, so he was able to convince the police that he really wasn't the Conorak was an adult. He was just his boyfriend. He was too, he was drunk. And it's just, and and it's an unfortunate thing that at the and at the end of the episode, it shows that Dahmer is allowed to take Conorak back into his apartment, where he unfortunately does kill him. Yeah. And during the credits of this scene of this episode, it actually plays the real recording between, um, Glen the Glenda and the police at. Um, talking about talking about this child 
and it's the real recording. It's like the the actual recording of that of the conversation. Oh, so sad. Had. And it just sends chills down my spine to hear it. Well, and like I think part of the, like the whole thing is like you think about it's 1991, so mm-hmm. AIDS was really kind of ramping it in was. the world. And yeah. these cops, you know, found this guy who said, who's saying, oh, this is my 19 year old boyfriend. Yeah. They don't want to they don't want to go near that. Mm-hmm. And I honestly think that might have been part of the issue was that they assume, you know what, they're gay. Like, you know, I don't want to go near them. I don't want to touch them because no one right. knew how like you could contract AIDS at that point. Right. And this is true. This is very true. I- like I, I honestly, and not that I'm giving those cops a break by any means, but like exactly. because they literally sent that child to his death. They did. But like I, I honestly think that might have been part of the problem. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. And as we said, this we're no, we're in no way condoning what the police did, because I mean the yeah. police contributed to this to this child's death, unfortunately. Get to the next wound. Doing yes. a Dahmer. <laughs> episode three. <laughs> Sorry, the, the name. I was just like, oh god. Yeah. Uh, so we go back to the late seventies when Dahmer's a high school senior and he's still showing interest in animal dissection and is at this point coming becoming aware of his sexual preference for men. And uh, this is after his father and his mother divorce. His father moves in with his new girlfriend. And then his mother leaves with his younger brother and leaves him in the house to fend for himself. Like, they just disappear. Yeah. Both of them. Like, and, and Jeffrey was 17, 18 years old at this point. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. Uh, so he begins to, you know, really get into drinking and you know he was lifting weights he was he started this is where like his fantasizing about you know men ha- started to happen and he then decides to pick up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks and invites him to drink beer and work out and Stephen rejects his sexual advances calls him a gay slur and so Dahmer hits him with a barbell and strangles him to death yes and two police officers later on stopped Dahmer when he was in his car because he was swerving. But they let him off with a warning, even though he had several garbage bags in his backseat. Which, which is, is a red flag. Yeah. Those police officers, there was nothing. There, there was no reason for them not to have searched that car. Then we get into episode four called The Good Boy Box. Okay. This episode um, takes place about three months after he, after Dahmer kills Stephen Hicks. Um, His father returns. He's shocked to find out that his ex-wife has already moved out and left Jeffrey there by himself. And he discovers that Jeffrey is a raging alcoholic at this point. I mean, He's a raging alcoholic, but Jeffrey being an alcoholic has discovered that he has very, he has a lot of homicidal thoughts. Obviously he's already committed homicide, but he tries to tell his father about the thoughts in his head because the man needs help. Um, But unfortunately his father doesn't really listen and tells him he's going to Ohio state university OSU. Dahmer is, goes to OSU but he is expelled because he does not attend class and he's drinking like a fish which <laughs> then his father sends him enlists him in the army and my dad has always said only one of two things happen to men in the army that are like Dahmer they either straighten up and become decent human beings and productive members of society or they just they, they go batshit crazy well, we know what happened to him. And uh, obviously, as we know, <laughs> Dahmer goes batshit crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And so in 1981, Jeffrey is honorably discharged, surprisingly, due to his due to being an alcoholic. 
His father sent at that point sends him to live with his grandmother Catherine. At her suggestion, he goes to a state. He goes to the state fair, where he gets drunk and is arrested for indecent exposure. Because <laughs> wasn't it he because he was he had pulled it out to take a leak or something? I think he had. I to think so. Him. Yeah, yeah. Is what it was for. Mm-hmm. But still, <laughs> so. He then gets a job as a phlebotomist, which is somebody who takes blood, um, where he will, where he starts to steal the blood bags and drink the blood. Yeah. And mind you, this is in the early 80s. This is in like yeah. the early 80s. So we hadn't really learned about AIDS all that much yet. It is starting to come around at this point, I think. But it really hadn't, I mean, it really becomes a big deal in the late 80s, early 90s. I mean, really big deal. And then Dahmer later begins going to a bathhouse for gay men, but is soon banned because he keeps drugging the men there. In 1987, and this one, what happens is an absolute horrible thing, but... It, it kind of made me giggle a little because he drugs himself on accident. Dahmer drugs himself on accident instead of drugging the man that he was with. Yeah. Maybe he drugged the man he was with too. I'm not, I'm not real clear on that one. Yeah. Because we he, won't know. Yeah. Cause he goes to a hotel room with this man, ends up drugging himself on accident and passes out. But unfortunately in his drug fueled blackout, he discovers that he has murdered this man. Um, he takes the body back to his, his grandmother's house and he dismembers it in the basement. He seals the man's head in a bag and places it in a lock box that his grandmother gave him, which I think is where the good boy box comes from. The yeah. title of it. And if you recall, when we did the initial Dahmer episode, mm-hmm. this is the one murder that he wasn't charged with because there was no proof right there was no proof that he did it because Dahmer himself doesn't even know if he really did it i mean but i mean pretty much i mean it's pretty much proven he did it but yeah it can't be proven in a court of law unfortunately right right that he meant to do it or whatever yeah so yes and then episode five is called blood on their hands this um takes place in 1987 After Dahmer takes a job at a chocolate factory, he begins to seek out victims with basically the intention of murdering and starts beginning a cycle of bringing men to his grandmother's house, drugging them, strangling them to death, and then dismembering them in the basement. And it really starts to cause a smell coming from the basement and causes a confrontation with his grandmother and his father. And Dahmer lies and just says it's caused by his taxidermy hobby. And Lionel just basically yells at him for not cleaning up after it adequately. And Dahmer promises that, you know, he'll just stop everything. And then Dahmer invites Ronald Flowers Jr., a man who was struggling with his car, to his grandmother's house with an attempt to drug and kill him. But after Flowers falls unconscious in the living room, his grandmother finds him and forces Jeffrey to put him on a bus. After Flowers reports this to the police, they question Dahmer and his grandmother, but find no evidence to arrest him. But later on, Dahmer is arrested after another victim, who is the brother of the 14 year old that he killed yes whose name is is some older this is the older brother older brother yes um whose name was some sack and who had escaped from him basically Dahmer was found guilty of sexual assault and sent to prison uh line his father writes a letter to the judge asking him to put jeffrey in for a treatment program for alcohol abuse But basically, the letter's ignored, and he's eventually released from custody a year later. A lot happened in that episode. Yeah. But Grandma basically saved Ronald Flowers. Yes. 
And, and unfortunately, uh, once again, the police just yeah didn't do their job. I mean, really. I mean, you can say that they maybe did, but it they really didn't. Otherwise, they would have stopped. They would have discovered this. Yeah, I mean, I guess also you ha- you have to kind of think about what like testing was like back then this compared to true. now. You know, true. I think in today's world, he would have gotten caught a lot faster because all they would have to do is take Flowers' blood and they would have found the drug. You know what I mean? Like back then, mm-hmm. I don't know what it was, you know, but it's just crazy. And I believe if I remember correctly, Conorak mentions to Dahmer that he is the brother of some sex. So Dahmer yes. n- like knew at that time mm-hmm. that it was the, the younger brother. Yes. So it's just crazy that like, mm. you know, that, that poor family, that poor, poor family. Oh, I know. I am just like, my God. We get into episode six called Silenced, and we're back in 1991, and we are, there is a uh, gentleman by the name of Tony Hughes, who is deaf, or partially deaf any, anyway, and he he's making a life for himself and a name for himself. He lands a job in Madison, Wisconsin, but returns to spend time with his family in Milwaukee on the weekends. So one weekend, one evening, one weekend evening, he's dancing at a gay bar and he and Dahmer, unfortunately, notices him. Dahmer thinks about taking Tony's drink at the bar, but reconsiders. Tony and Dahmer say they like each other and they meet again the following weekend. Dahmer invites Tony into his apartment where he again considers drugging him, but resists. The two sleep together and the following morning, Tony says he has to leave for work. Dahmer gets a hammer, but lets Tony go. However, when Tony turns for his keys, Dahmer unfortunately kills him with a hammer. Tony's mother contacts the police when her son has not checked in and and has missed work. They seemingly do nothing. Once again, they're just apathetic towards it because he's a gay man. And so she posts missing person signs all over Milwaukee. As she does this, she notices many other such signs near the gay bars. However, the one thing that sets Jeffrey apart from some other serial killers is that all of his victims, minus, I think, Stephen Hicks, were... There was another color. one, too. I think there's, okay. there's like, two, because there's, there's, like, a Jewish guy later on, also. Yeah. But, yeah, they're, they were all men of color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and Tony was a was a was a man of color and also a gay man, so I think that was another reason why the police just didn't really care. Yeah, unfortunately, this this episode actually made me cry. Like I love Tony, you know, know. like he was such a kind soul. I mean, obviously, Mm -hmm. it all broke my heart, but like Tony was such a kind soul, and like his sister was. Mm you know, newly pregnant and all that. And like, you know, he just had such love for his family and his friends and his family and his friends adored him. And like for this to happen, like it just, it's just horrible. It's just absolutely horrible. It really was. My heart just like completely broke. It breaks for each victim, but for some reason, like it, it struck a chord with me with Tony. Yeah, and maybe it's because he was deaf. You know, it's not like he could hear Dahmer coming. Right. Um. The other one that the one that really hit me the most besides besides Tony would have to be Conorak. Yeah. yeah. That one. No, I agree. That one. That one really, really hit home. Uh So episode seven's called Cassandra. And this follows after Dahmer's arrested and news of his victims become public. And there's widespread outrage with the police among the victims' families and mostly Glenda Cleveland. She's most upset about the murder of Conorak because, as we mentioned, her and her daughter were the ones that found him and tried to help him and called the police to, to you know, basically save him. Um, and she's just been absolutely traumatized 
by listening to the screams and the power tools coming from Dahmer's apartment. Mm -hmm. And the building is considered hazardous due to the chemicals he used to dissolve the, the body parts and tenants were evacuated and it kind of forces Glenda to get a motel room since she wasn't allowed to be in her apartment. Uh, Jesse Jackson takes an interest in the case due to the large number of uh, people of color or men of color, I should say, uh, yeah. that are victims. And he meets with Glenda, who tells him everything that she witnessed, all the horrors and everything. And even mentions a time when Dahmer was angry and served her a sandwich and she wondered if it was made from human remains. And basically this makes Jackson vow to hold the Milwaukee police accountable for all of their oversights, which I mean, absolutely. The police just missed the ball on this in every way, shape or form. I mean, you literally listen to every mm -hmm. single victim and the police screwed up like they yes. it, it just. Yes, but this episode got me like in the chill factor, like thinking about mm -hmm. Glenda sitting there listening like she yeah. actually heard the murders yeah like that it like that's when like it creeped me out like I was just like oh my god like I can't I can't even I, I know right I, I I I I get you on that one Ugh. yeah episode eight is called Lionel and this is this episode takes place as after he's been arrested it, and it's Lionel Dahmer is horrified by what his son by what his son has done and with his second wife he is trying to deal with the demons um blaming alternately blaming himself and his ex-wife Joyce for the way his son for the way Jeffrey turned out um Jesse Jackson continues working on the on behalf of the victims families the two officers who were suspended over Conorak's case are reinstated, which I think is awful. Yep. Dahmer goes to trial after his insanity plea is denied. After he is sentenced to 15 life terms and victim statements are heard, Dahmer is given a chance to speak. He says he knows he is mentally ill and, apologiz and apologizes to the families. Lionel finds writing a book about being Jeffrey's father is therapeutic. There is a lot of controversy in that book. Yeah. The there was a lot of controversy over the book, which they go into the next episode about. Yeah. Which is called The Boogeyman. Yes. Um, family of the victims deal with their grief and fear and just horror. Yes. And... Um, after convincing Tony Hughes's mother to sue uh, Dahmer's father over the profits of his book, um, a lawyer brings a $14 million lawsuit against the city of Milwaukee on behalf of the victim's families. Lionel learns that any profits from his book will be paid to the victim's families. Meanwhile, in prison, Dahmer has begun receiving fan mail several people sending him money in exchange for autograph items which he obliges and and gives which is just disgusting but it is but this yeah and for, like i said um if you look up if you look up photos of Jeffrey Dahmer for you granted you have to remember that when these photos were taken it was between the 70s and 80s Okay, these pictures were taken between the 70s and 80s, early 90s. For that time frame, he is not an unattractive man. He is not. So, and unfortunately, it happens with all serial killers. You get the women that are, most of them, granted, most of them have to be mentally ill themselves. They have to be. That find serial killers to be it gets it gets them off for some reason i don't yeah. know that's why i do not see it and then this brings us into episode 10 and the final episode which is called 
called God of Forgiveness, God of Vengeance. And this episode, it's um, after attending a church service in prison, in prison, uh, Dahmer is asked to be asked to be baptized. And this is around the same time as John Wayne Gacy's execution. And we will talk about John Wayne Gacy another day because I think they're going to be making another episode about um, him. Another season of another couple of seasons of Monster. And I have a feeling Gacy's going to be one because the killer clown. Yeah. Gacy was the Creep. killer clown. Creepy. Yeah. So um so he was asked to be baptized near the same time as John Wayne Gacy's execution. The $14 million lawsuit is settled out of court for less than $900,000. Joe Zeibler, angered that people plan to profit by selling items removed from Dahmer's home, offers the dealers double their asking price. He then gives every victim's family a share of what he paid, saying all the items will be destroyed. An inmate named Christopher Scarver kills Dahmer and another inmate, Jesse Anderson, with a metal bar saying that God told him to commit the murder. Unfortunately, obviously, Christopher Scarver is all, was mentally ill. I mean, I must, I'm going to assume schizophrenia. Mm. I'm not diagnosing. I'm assuming <laughs> he, he, was probably a, he was probably schizophrenic. Per Dahmer's wishes, his body was cremated and no funeral was held for him. But he wanted his brain kept for scientific research. His father, Lionel, insists that the brain also be destroyed while his mother wants it to, to be studied. Lionel explains that he and the victim's families just want closure, which would be made more difficult by retaining the brain. A judge sides with Lionel and the brain is cremated. As, Mil as Milwaukee residents watch, the Oxford apartments are destroyed. Now, the Oxford apartments are where he committed a vast majority of his crimes. Glenda meets with a city official to advocate for the site of the apartments to be turned into a memorial for the victims, but is warned that it will be a lengthy process. And that's the end. Um, that's the end of the show. Um, the photos and names of all of his victims are displayed in the closing credits, which also states that no memorial has yet been built for these victims, which it should be. I, I, Truly believe it should be. Yeah. I yeah. Like why would you not? Right. Oh boy. Um, okay. So I'll go real quick through kind of what was fact and what was fiction. Because okay. as we mentioned, you know, Hollywood likes to put their own spin on things sometimes. So uh okay. So Glenda Cleveland didn't live in the Oxford apartments. She never met Dahmer. Um, she kind of represents, you know, some of the actual, I guess, uh, neighbors, but, uh, mm -hmm. she never lived inside the building. She lived in a neighboring building, so she didn't, you know, but she did actually try to alert local police and FBI about like the, the behavior and stuff like that. Um, so that, mm -hmm. that part actually is true. Uh, Dahmer fed sandwiches to his actual neighbor, whose name was Pamela Bass. And, you know, she went on the record confirming Dahmer was friendly and sharing and confirmed that he fed her sandwiches. And they, she expressed fear that it might have contained human flesh, which is horrifying. Disgusting. So that's where that scene came from. Yes. Uh, Dahmer did not drink bags of blood while working at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center. So that was a lie. I figured that one would be because that just kind of. Yeah. Yeah. They had to uh, sensationalize that. I was like, never heard that. <laughs> yeah. The police officers uh, involved in the Canarac uh, murder, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. uh, did not receive officer of the year like they did in the series. Thank God, because that would just yeah. be. Um, Dahmer did not wear his glasses during his trial, which. 
okay. he had on during the in the show. Yeah. Dahmer did often show his victims the Exorcist 3 movie. <laughs> um, mm. Dahmer did say to Tracy Edwards, I want to hear your heart because I'm going to eat it. Yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer was pulled over by police when he had human remains in his car. Dahmer was previously arrested. Dahmer's father, Lionel, did ask uh, for a judge to intervene after Dahmer was convicted for sexually assaulting the brother of one of his victims. So that was true. Dahmer harassed his victim's family members. I okay. think I've read that somewhere. Yeah. I think I'd read that That's... somewhere before. So, yeah. Uh, it In the show, and they said it's true, he called the families on the phone and told them to stop looking for their missing loved ones. Which is just horrible. Oh. Uh... Uh, Glenda Cleveland repeatedly followed up with Milwaukee police about her suspicions, which is, you know, very true. She, um, she called multiple times and was ignored. Yes. And they think it's because she, number one, that building was lower class Mm -hmm. and she was a woman of color. That neighborhood, I'll say. It was the slums of Milwaukee, unfortunately. And the vast majority of people that lived in the buildings were people of color. Right. Uh, Cleveland did meet with Jesse Jackson following Dahmer's arrest. And the tenants in the Oxford Apartments complained about the smell and noise multiple times. So there you go. Yeah. Not as much false as I actually thought. Um, But, yeah. Surprisingly enough. Yeah. There was mixed reviews, you know, critic reviews. And then, you know, obviously it was watched a lot. It, it did very, very well on Netflix. It was like number one on the on Netflix for a while. Uh, mm-hmm. It did receive a lot of backlash as a result. Um, people assumed that they were going to be um, making Dahmer look better than he was. And I guess I, I do get it because as we talked about in the last episode we did about Dahmer, there were you know kids on tiktok and i call them kids because they're teenagers or you know whatever and like they were talking about how hot Dahmer was because they're talking about evan peters they're not talking about Dahmer himself but it's like they were talking about Dahmer. you know like that's what they would call him Dahmer. and like people were dressing up as Dahmer for halloween and like stuff like that and it's like again as you mentioned at the beginning of this episode this was this is a true story this guy this psychopath really yes. did this. Yes. So like, don't make him out to be this like amazing. Th- like, ugh. he so, is not, he is not to be idolized. He is not no. to be, um, considered someone to look up to and can, and be like, yeah, he was so attractive. He was so hot. Yes. He, he wasn't, a, he, for the time he was considered an attractive man. However, Evan Peters is obviously a very attractive individual. And mm-hmm. now I'm talking about the actor Evan Peters is a, is an attractive he is an attractive man. He is not my type, but that does not that does not distract from the fact that he is an attractive man. How and when he plays Dahmer, obviously he's going to bring, you can't hide his attractive in, attractiveness unless you're putting him in full prosthetic makeup. Right. So yes, right. which he, he didn't so, need to be. Exactly. So, yes, you're bringing in Evan's natural attractiveness as himself into the role he's playing. And, yes, that makes the monster that he is playing much more attractive. That does mm-hmm. not mean you – you people have got to start separating actors from characters. Yes. Because I will sit here and tell you all day long that – Evan Peters playing Dahmer, he was creepy. He was so goddamn creepy in that that it, it turned it, it turned me off. But the this show, I know Ryan Murphy said like one of his biggest things was he wasn't going through the uh, point of view of Dahmer it's himself, but more of his victims. He didn't want to idolize Dahmer. He wanted to show what the victims actually went through and things like that. 
But a lot of the family members of Dahmer's victims spoke out saying they were never even notified that this was being made. Which and is awful. which is horrible. And, you know, obviously they weren't happy about this show. And it caused a lot of trauma to them. You know, they were already traumatized. And now they're kind of being like re-traumatized by you know, this, this show coming out, you know, and it just, it, it's just a sad situation. And as I mentioned, um, and I know you're going to go over like the um, Golden Globe things, but it, yeah. it seems to kind of be a trend with the Golden Globes this year, like I said, for like the limited series and or movies is, you know, you have Dahmer, and you have people saying they weren't notified, victims' family saying they weren't notified. You have Pam and Tommy, where Pamela Anderson never agreed to have her story be told. And a lot of people had an issue or have an issue yeah. uh, with them making that. Um, you have Staircase mm-hmm. and like the, the, you know, the family that the Staircase revolves around, like the kids were saying that they were re-traumatized by that movie. So it's like, you know, Hollywood's kind of getting into this whole thing where they're taking real life things and making, you know, films out of them. And it's like, it mm-hmm. it has always been, you know, we've always had that. But now it's like people, I think, are starting to really take exception because of the fact that a lot of, especially if it's like you're making this show or movie or whatever, and the people that were involved or the the families that were involved are still around that's just so re-traumatizing. Like, I'm not mm-hmm. saying that we shouldn't, you know, one day Jeffrey Dahmer shouldn't be told so that people know, like, look at what this horrible human being did. Exactly. You know, but it's like the, those victims, family, it wasn't that long ago. It was the 90s. No. It was the 80s. These people, I mean, like, their families are still alive. Yeah. You know, so it's like you're you're asking them to live through it again. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and I vaguely remember when he got arrested. Yeah, I was I'm young. old enough to remember. I was, like four. That. I was nine. Yeah. I mean, I obviously obviously I didn't know at the time why he got arrested, but I, re- I vaguely remember seeing it on the news that he was arrested. Now, there are some uh, there there were um, some good things that. <sighs> Should some good things that came out of the out of this episode out of these shows, and that was um, Dan Feinberg of the Hollywood Reporter. He praised episode six, the silenced episode, as easily the best episode of the series, an uncomfortably sweet and sad hour of TV that probably should have been the template for the entire show. And in placing a black, deaf, gay man at the center of the narrative. The series is giving voice to somebody whose voice has too frequently been excluded from gawking serial killer portraits, which is absolutely true. Yeah. And maybe that's why, like, it touched me so much. But I'm like, the fact that he mentioned that episode, like, that episode really got Mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Like, I remember just, like, sitting there and I cried. Like, I just cried. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I knew what was going to happen. Like, I knew he was one of the victims, mm-hmm. but in my head, I just yeah. kept thinking, please don't let it happen. Like, please, please don't yeah, do no. it. Please don't do it. I like, know. No. I know. But, yeah. And another, um, Kayla Cobb at the at Decider even said about the entire show as a whole, the show isn't just well-directed, written, and acted. It's rewriting what a crime drama can look like if we stop glorifying murderers and start focusing more on sy- systematic failures, which is absolutely true because yep, the agreed. system failed so many people. It yep. failed so many people and it does not. And that is the one thing I did like about the show. It did not glorify Jeffrey. It did not make him to be out to be like this wonderful person. It's, right. it, it basically said this man is evil. This man is a monster. This man has done all these horrific things. And this is what he did. Yes, they should have spoken to all the victims' families. 
and told them that they were going, that they were writing this and thinking about writing this and they wanted to portray it and maybe portray it and, t- and try to explain to the victim fam the victim's families, the, the way they were going to portray it. Maybe it would have lessened the traumatization of it for the, fa- for them again. Mm-hmm. Now on December 6th of this year, um, Monster won the People's Choice Award for the most binge-worthy TV show. So it has won that award. Mm. Now we have several. I, I'm not sure about um, some of these. Uh, the Holly, Hollywood Music and Media Awards on November 17th. Uh, best Music Supervision for Television. Uh, Amanda Creek Thomas, I they were nominated. I do not think they won, but they were nominated. Yeah. Um, now the Golden Globe Awards are coming up on January 10th. And there are the um this has been, excuse me, uh nominated for several awards. Um, best limited or anthology series or t- or television film for the entire show. Best Actor in a Limited Series, Anthology Series, or Television Motion Picture for Evan Peters. Um, Best Supporting Actress for Niecy Nash. Best Supporting Actor for Richard Jenkins. Which I truly believe are... it. They should all win. Yeah. I think they should all win. Yeah. The nominations are definitely deserved. Yes, definitely. Now, the Critics' Choice Awards will be on January 15th, and Niecy Nash has been uh, nominated for Best Supporting Actress in the Limited Series or Movie Made for Television. And on February 11th um, will be the Satellite Awards. These are the only ones that I know of at the moment. Um, And it's Best Actor in a Miniseries, Limited Series, or Motion Picture Made for Television, Evan Peters. Best Miniseries or Limited Series, which is the entire show. And then best actor for Rich uh, in a supporting role is Richard Jenkins. So all of the, all of these are well-deserved. The nominations are well-deserved. Uh, I do think that I do think they should win because they were fantastic in the acting. Mm-hmm. But that does not mean that I want it that I want, that I think it needs to win for the you no know, entertainment value of it because it was not entertainment. Right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Catch us next time. And see what we're going to talk about. Because the three fates decide.